Go to Revelation and back up a little bit and you'll find 1 John. All right. All right. Give me a few seconds to get situated up here. All right. No, I'm good. That's left. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Okay. So I can see everybody. Well, how's everybody doing? Good. Good. Feels like, I think it's been about three or four months since I've been back. Probably, I think, about three months. And it always feels like coming home. And that it has a, a great feel to be with uh, people who have been through some things with me for a couple of years and know what I've been through, and I know what y'all have been through, and it's good to actually fellowship in in that way, so it's good to be back. Is everybody good? Everybody been okay? Okay, she's going to tape me up here. Well, today we're going to look about (laughs) being an overcomer, and that that song about Jesus being the pain taker, this fits really good here, because he breaks every chain. And we're going to see this this evening that Jesus has already broke the chain. And we're going to look at that a little bit this evening. Raise it up a little bit more. Sorry for technical difficulties here. No, no, go back. The left, that first page needs to go right. I can't see it. I'm getting old. All right, we're in 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12 in a few minutes. How many of y'all have seen the show The Biggest Loser? The Biggest Loser. They have made 17 seasons of The Biggest Loser reality show where these guys and girls come in and they want to lose weight. They really, for physical reasons, they really need to lose weight. So they go into the biggest loser to see who can lose the most weight. Because they got a huge obstacle to overcome. And the reason why I think that it has went on for 17 seasons is because we like to see people overcome, don't we? We like to see people down with with great odds and then coming back to achieve their goal, to overcome their obstacles. And we might see that with the Dallas Cowboys this year. I'm I'm hopeful for you guys. No. I'm looking for them to overcome. I hope they do. If they keep going like they're going, they're going to overcome. But today we're going to see that you and I, we are overcomers through the blood of Jesus Christ. The chain has been broken, and we're going to see that tonight. Let's look at verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Underline that if you got a pen right there. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. In this passage of Scripture, John addresses three different groups of people, children, fathers, and young men. Now, some believe he's talking to literal age groups here, or either he's talking to three different levels of Christian maturity, young children, fathers, young men. But I believe there are things here that apply to everyone, no matter what age or gender they are. These things are true for you, and they're true for me. They're true for children, fathers, men, women, and these things are true for us. And there's five of these. We're forgiven, We know him, we are strong, God's word abides in you, and we have overcome the evil one. All all of these words indicate victory, right? 
indicate overcoming, and it indicates to us that we are overcomers. Now we're going to look at three ways that the evil one tries to make us feel like we're overcome. And we're going to see three ways how we are already overcomers today. So the first thing, the evil one, he brings guilt and shame for our sins. But we are forgiven. Look at verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. Now in the Greek language, this is in the perfect tense. Now the perfect tense, I really like this tense. Because it means it's an event that happened in the past. And its ramifications or its effects carry on to the present day. So what John is saying here is that your sins were forgiven. That's the moment you put your faith in Jesus. You're born again. You're converted to Christ. Your sins are forgiven. But the effects carry on till today. So you get what he's saying here? Your sins were forgiven, they are forgiven, and they will continue to be forgiven on into the future. So we have overcome our sins because we are forgiven. And notice that uh, forgiving means that our sins have been put away. The guilt, the defilement, the penalty, all that has been taken away at the cross. And notice also this is in the passive voice. This means that we didn't generate this forgiveness of ourselves. It was bestowed upon us. God forgave us. And it's his act. Notice there it says, for his name's sake. We're not forgiven for our name's sake because we've already messed up. Our our personhood would not earn us forgiveness. There's nothing in us that would grant that. So it comes from God, and it's for his name's sake. Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. We will come back to 1 John, so keep your finger there. Y'all with me? Are you with me, Micah? Okay. All right. It says, talking about Jesus, who his own self bore or bare, carried up, our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. For ye all, as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. So it says that our sins are forgiven for his namesake because Jesus took our sins upon him in his own body. He died on the cross to break that chain of sin that held us bound together. Now remember that moment in your life when you realized you were chained up in sin. And Jesus came and you heard the gospel. He broke that chain off of you and you have been set free. But guys, the sad reality is even though we've been set free, we want to wrap those chains back around. We want to try to lock them up around us again. And Jesus says, what are you doing? I bore your sins in my flesh on the tree and here you are trying to chain yourself up again. What are you doing? You're an overcomer. And that's kind of what's being said here. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. How do we get access into this forgiveness that Christ offers to us? Now this verse here can be applied to a lost sinner who needs to come to Christ. But it's also applied to believers who have broken the fellowship between themselves and God. Sometimes we do that, don't we? God doesn't, you know, leave us, but sometimes we walk away from him for a time, and this is how we get back in fellowship 
with him. So it can apply to you. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ today, this can apply to you how you can have your sins forgiven. But also those of us who are believers in Christ, this also demonstrates how you and I can have our fellowship restored from God or with God when we fall away, which sometimes we do. Uh, it's first, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, notice his integrity here is in question. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, to confess your sins doesn't just mean say, yeah, I did wrong. I apologize. That was bad. And that's not what it means. It means to agree with God about our sins. Agree with God that our sins are an affront to a holy God. Our sins are a rebellion against God. So when we confess our sins, you don't just list them and say, oops. You say, yes, I agree, God. These sins are a transgression of your holy law, your holy word that I've failed to live up to. If you confess those, notice, he is faithful and he is just. Meaning if God doesn't forgive you, then God is not a God of integrity. And we know God to be completely without sin. So God's very integrity is wrapped in this verse. So if you feel like you're just weighed down by your sins and God will never forgive you for the things you've done, this verse says otherwise. And he will forgive you. But notice that. God doesn't stop there. God wants you to be cleansed from it in your life. Not just forgiven for it, but he wants to take it out of your life. He is the chain breaker. And it's really cool how God put that song here. He is the, the chain breaker. And Jesus wants to break the chain. But we want to wrap it all up in us. And Satan, the evil one, he wants to bring that shame to you. He wants to say, oh, Ricky, remember what you did last week? Pastor, remember what you did? Remember you raised your voice a few years ago? Notice I said a few years ago. You cut that guy off in traffic, Lance? And Satan brings that stuff up, doesn't he? He brings that back up to us. He says, look what you did. And you know what we say? Look what Jesus did, and look where you're going. You know, tell him to turn to the book of Revelation. Don't turn there. We're going to tell Satan to turn there. That's where he's going. So the evil one, he wants you to be weighed down with your guilt, with your shame. But God has forgiven you. In the perfect tense, he forgave you, he continues to forgive you, and he will always forgive you. Turn back to 1 John. You're already there, but go to 1 John 2. And we're going to go to verse 13 now. So next thing, the evil one wants to separate you from the Father and the Son. But you know him. The evil one wants to separate you from the Father and the Son, but you know him. Look at verse 13. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. That's referring to Jesus. Write down in your notes uh, 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 4. When you get home, you can go look that up. Because it's talking about he that's from the beginning is Jesus, if you look in that passage later. Look at verse 13. I write to you children because you know the Father. So he says that the fathers know the Father, or though he's from the beginning, that's Jesus, and the children know the Father. So what he's saying here is that whether you're a child or an adult, whatever phase of your Christian life you're in, you know Jesus. So when Satan tries to separate you from God, he's got to go somewhere else because you know Jesus. And now this just isn't a casual knowledge. The word know is the, the Greek word gnosko, and that means to know by personal experience. To know by personal experience. Now, uh, Michael will remember this. 
when we went to the youth conference, the movement, that, that trip we took to the youth conference, took the teenagers over to Fort Worth, and a guy, Clayton King, preached. I mean, he preached the fire out of our youth. It really fired them up. We came back, and several of them got baptized and were saved on that trip. But Clayton King, me and Joseph, were, were walking around in the atrium before the, before the big conference, and we saw the, the big speaker that was going to speak, Clayton King, and he stopped us, and he took a picture of us and posted it on Twitter. So I can say I know Clayton King, but I don't really know him. If he saw me today, he might be like, who are you? But I met him, and he's a great preacher, and it's like awesome. But I don't know him from personal experience. That's not the kind of knowledge that this is talking about. It's saying that we know him from personal experience. He is our Savior. He walks with us. He talks with us. We know that Jesus. In John chapter 17, you don't have to turn there. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, he says this to the Father in prayer. And this is eternal life. That they know you, same word, gnosko, know from experience, know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus said that eternal life is to know from experience the Father and Jesus Christ. So when Ch Satan tries to say, you're separated from God, say, no, I know him from experience. He's walked with me. He's talked with me. I know my Savior lives. And I really want you guys to turn here. Not only do we know the Father and the Son, but he knows you. Amen. Turn with me to uh, John chapter 10 in the gospel. Turn back to John chapter 10. One of my favorite passages here. John chapter 10. And we're going to begin in verse 14. Is everybody there with me? Gospel of John, written by the same author, by the way. This is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. Gnosko, he knows you from experience. He knows his own. And my own know me from personal experience, from walking with me and talking with me. Look at verse 27. Skip down a little bit. My sheep hear my voice, and I know, Gnosko, I know them, and they follow me. I give to them eternal life, and they will never perish. Never. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. That is, notice the great security there. Not only do we know him, but he knows you, Micah. He knows you, Julie. He knows you, Miss Janet. He knows you. Isn't that a great thought? Wait a minute. Maybe that might not be a good thought. That means he, know what, he knows what you said last night. He knows where you went last week. He knows that ridiculous comment I put on Facebook. Yes, I'm still working on that, guys. He knows me. That's a great thought and a horrifying thought. But notice the security there, go. He knows us. We're in his hand. And we'll never perish. And no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. So when Satan comes to you and says, you're separated from God. No, I'm not. Go sell that to someone else who's buying. I'm not buying that today. Go on down the road. So we cannot be separated from God. Turn with me to the book of Romans. I love this. Go to the book of Romans. Hey, y'all come to church to read the Bible. So we don't come here just to, to hear a little story and go home. We, we come to hear the word of God. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Get 
know something about the chain maker, the chain breaker. He breaks the chain, but then we're chained to him. Oh, how y'all like that one? All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 20, uh, 35. Who shall chef, who shall, hey, I have a ministry and I record a video every once a week, uh, once a day every week, and I can rewind it and start over. When you're preaching, brother, pastor, you can't do that, can you? Once it, once it goes out of your mind and out of your mouth, oops, gets out. Hey, but I like the ministry I have now. I can just say, oh, redo that, redo that. And Christina laughs at me. She'll be in her room for about 30 minutes for me to do an eight-minute video. <laughs> can I leave? It's time for the buzzword. Oh, man. It's time for the buzzword for the day. I, so I get to try over and over again. So let's try that again. Y'all ready? Just pretend like we're recording again. <laughs> All right. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we're never going to be separated from God. If you have placed your faith in him, you are secure in him, and nothing and nobody can snatch you out of God's hand. You are secure for all eternity. Now hang on. Satan can't separate you from God. Do you know what he can do to you? He can make you think you're separated from God. He can make you think that that sin you committed is so great and so bad that God will never, ever love you again. Or he can make you feel like when you're going through trials and tribulations that God has left you. And he'll make you feel like you're separated from God, that God don't care about you no more. Why don't you just give up on him? Like Job's wife told him in the book of Job. Honey, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, that's great encouragement, isn't it? <laughs> he said, I think I won't do that. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So whatever you're going through in life, don't think God has quit loving you because you're going through it. He is still there with you. You know him. He knows you. And nothing's going to separate you from him. Now, Daniel has this little girl at school that he likes. Now, they say in preaching class, before you use your family as an illustration, make sure they're okay with that. I, I okayed it. Daniel's okay with this. So Daniel has this little girl at school that he likes, and she likes him some days, some days. She's like, she's like any other girl, Micah. And let me tell you about this girl. Her name's, her name's uh, Eva. So Daniel and Eva. And the kids will come up to Daniel and say, Eva says she don't like you no more. Because they're jealous. They like Eva. So they want other Daniel to think that Eva doesn't like him. So he says, Daniel, Eva doesn't like you. So he'll go and ask Eva, do you still like me? And they all the way around. The kids tell Eva, that, oh, Daniel don't like you no more. So he comes home every day telling us, about the evolution of this drama in fifth grade. I'm like, I put my arm around Daniel. I said, Daniel, comes a time in your life when we got to have a talk. Daniel, girls are very complicated. Just know that now, and everything's good. But see, that's how Satan works. He tries to tell you, oh, God don't love you. God's not your friend no more. And you can say, no, he knows me, I know him, and nothing's going to separate me from him. All right? Move my page over. The last point for tonight. The evil one. Thank you. The 
evil one brings falsehood, but we are strong and we have overcome. Well, that's kind of (laughs) crooked. I can't turn my head that way. I need to just preach with an iPad. All right, here we go. Okay, the evil one brings falsehood, but we're strong and we have overcome. Turn with me back to 1 John. This is the last, well, there's one more verse after this, but go to 1 John chapter uh, 2 and verse 14. This will be the second half of verse 14. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, in the book of 1 John, John is writing to Christians in Asia Minor. Now, these Christians had never seen Jesus face to face, most of them. And there were false teachers that were coming into the church and were teaching weird things about Jesus. They were called the Gnostics. They thought that all flesh was evil. So God would not take a body and become man in Jesus. So Jesus didn't really have a body is what they taught. And they're also teaching that Jesus wasn't God in the flesh. Lots of weird things they were teaching. But they're also teaching two other things. Either the dramatic Denial of your body, your flesh is evil, so let me just beat it up and you know, cut it and beat it and treat it bad because it's bad. Let me starve my flesh. But the other extreme was a, a revel in your flesh. Do everything your flesh wants to do. Sin all you want because your body is evil. And God doesn't care about your body. He just cares about your knowledge. He just cares about that secret knowledge that he can give you. And that's what these false teachers were teaching. And John wrote 1 John to correct their thinking. And as you read 1 John, keep that in mind. And in this last part of this verse here, he's saying that you're strong. The word's in you. And you've overcome the evil one. And the evil one is the one that Satan influences those false teachers to teach these false things. So we see that we're strong, God's word's in us, so we cannot be led astray by false teaching, by Jehovah Witnesses, or Mormons, or oneness, well, I'm going to get told with that, oneness Pentecostals that deny the Trinity. We need to stand for God's truth, and we are strong, and his word abides in us. But that's who John's talking to, He's talking to them. They're being influenced by false teaching. But he says you're strong. God's spirit dwells in us. And we know truth from error. And we're strong in the Lord. Now where did Iron Man go? Okay. How many of y'all ever seen Iron Man? Come on, anybody? Okay, Iron Man is one of me and Daniel's favorite superheroes. Now Iron Man, he's he's, he's really obnoxious until he puts the suit on. He's a billionaire. Uh, he's made money making rockets and different things. But when Iron Man puts on the suit, he becomes almost invincible. Take the suit off, you're just a, a terrible man with a bad attitude, arrogant, bad dude. But he put the suit on and he becomes Iron Man. He can shoot rockets out of his missiles out of his hands and just lots of cool things fly around like a rocket ship. But he takes the suit off. He becomes nothing. Catch this. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, God wraps you in the righteousness of Jesus. God puts his Holy Spirit in you and the Bible tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make a way for sin in our life. So when you come to faith in Jesus, you have put on the suit. You are strong. Now sometimes you feel like pawing up in the rocking chair with a blanket and crying for mom and your daddy. So I'll be honest, don't you feel like that sometimes? Or not crying for mom and daddy, but 
You know what I mean? Just go away. Leave me alone. I'm, I'm, I'm weak. But when you, you have the suit on, you are strong. So in Jesus, you are strong. You are an overcomer. And John says these young men were strong. The word abides in you. That word abide means to dwell in you as a home. How many of y'all are thinking about home right now? What a thought. When you go to the hospital, what do you think about? When can I go home, Doc? So this word here has the idea of abiding in you. God's word was at home in their life. And when God's word's at home in your life, that means you're reading it, you're allowing it to come into your mind, but don't just leave it in your mind. Atheists know the Bible better than Christians. It's in their mind. And guess where it didn't go? It didn't go to their heart. Their minds are blinded by their uh, rejection of Christ. But when God's word is abiding in your heart, it's not just in your mind, it's in your heart. And then it works its way out in your actions. So the only way that they were strong is because they were in Christ, they had the suit on, their iron man. The word of God was in them and they overcome the wicked one. Now the evil one, he is a defeated adversary, guys. The death blow was given to him and he's bleeding out on the floor. Now let me say this. Satan has some influence. But he wants to trick you into thinking you don't know God. God hasn't forgiven you. These false teachers, they're right. You should listen to them. No. This passage should be an encouragement to you guys that you are forgiven. Remember in the Greek language, the perfect tense. That means it's an event that happened in the past, but the, the effect is carried on till today. So your sins were forgiven. They are forgiven. They'll always be forgiven. You know him. You'll continue to know him on into the future. You're strong in him, and you'll continue to be strong. God's word abides in you, and it'll continue to abide in you. And you have overcome the evil one. And you will continue to overcome the evil one. So stop putting the chain back around yourself. You are free. So let's start living as if we're free. Because we are free. Let's pray real quick. Uh, dear Jesus, I thank you for just continuing to use me in my weakness. Because in my weakness, you are strong. God, I pray that you would begin working now. I've prayed, I've prepared, I've presented. Now, Holy Spirit, I need you to just work in my brothers' and sisters' hearts tonight. I don't know if there's people here that are overcome with guilt and shame or Satan's tricked them into thinking that they're separated from God. Or maybe they're being swayed by false teaching or they're not in their Bible like they should be. Help them more to run to their Bible and to run to it every day and find strength and shelter and hope and power in those scriptures because it is your holy word. Be with us now, Father, as we allow you to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Pastor. God's people said, amen. God bless you. We're going to have just a few moments as the instruments play for a time of invitation tonight. You need to come and pray. These prayer altars are open.